Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast. The month of April rolls onward, getting close to the merry month of May, which happens to be the month of, of my birthday, but we'll leave that discussion for May. I'm Illegal 86. I am one of your three ever so stalwart hosts. I am joined, of course, by, I'm going to do individual intros today, Nerd Bomber. Nerd Bomber, how are you? I'm doing great. You know, I'm feeling it again this week. This is two weeks back to back that I'm just like in the zone. The world is not ready. Tactic, are you feeling it? I'm feeling it, Mr. Krabs. Feeling it, Can you feel it, Mr. Krabs? Yeah. You you know how sad it's going to be when people stop understanding? Like, if any of us are ever to have children, they're not going to get that joke. They'll still watch SpongeBob. Uh, Well, yeah, I am going to make my kid watch. You know how when we were kids, like Bugs Bunny had been around for a while. It wasn't mainstream when we grew up, but we still know, hey, what's up, Doc? You know, I feel like it's going to be one of those things. So do you think like, because was it called Boomerang? The like cartoons that come back kind of thing? Or like they had like Boomerang Hour on like Cartoon Network? Yeah, yeah, it was that was the Cartoon Network. And then there was something else on Nick. I can't remember what it was. Nick at Night? Might have been. No. I, I, well, I don't know, but but SpongeBob is going to be that, and like I have, my uncles are all like, frankly, kind of obsessed with Foghorn Leghorn. They would gather us kids around the television and like watch this. We'd watch like Foghorn Leghorn, and it's like Looney Tunes. They're like skits. They're like like little ten minute, but most kind of things. I don't know, like SpongeBob is actually, but I remember thinking, this isn't that funny, and they're like what they're like dying laughing. That's going to be me, and that's going to be all of us in. Probably not that long, you know, not, not to like start this episode off with a note of like sobering mortality, but we're all aging. My birthday's coming up in May. It's going to be a merry occasion. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get another year older. It's going to be May. How many it's 90s references Bro. can I pack into this opener? But that's another thing that when you, you're going to say that, and you know what? It might not even be a, a kid, like, it, like it, a kid that you have. It might be like, you'll be at work one day and you'll make that joke and some Gen Z or, or Zoomer or whatever they're calling him is going to stare at you and be like, what are you talking about? Everybody knows it though because it's a meme. Like memes live on. Are meme- so you think memes are, are transcendent? You think memes they last are forever? forever. I could get behind that. I hope that's true. I love a good meme. We're not going to talk about memes today. We're not going to talk about SpongeBob today. Although that would be a great episode. We're going to talk about some high profile movie trailers. We got, we got a big scoop. I mean, we're talking about the Shang Chi trailer, which that dropped today, the day that we're recording this, Monday the nineteenth. Talking about that, we're gonna be talking about Army of the Dead, which dropped last week, and then we're also gonna be talking about some game development news from Amazon. You wouldn't really think of Amazon as a game developer, but there's some news coming out from them that we're gonna talk about. I want to start with. I know Shang Chi is the bigger deal, but I want to start with Army of the Dead because we're gonna go chronological. And the Army of the Dead trailer came out last week. Now. Army of the Dead, uh, of course, this is Zack Snyder's next thing, basically, for those Zack Snyder fanboys out there, um, which I, of which I'm sure there are many. The, when I first saw and heard about this trailer, the reason I heard slash saw was that Tignataro was trending. Now, Tignataro is one of those people that I don't really know what their deal is. Is she a comedian? Do we know anything about Tignataro? I know I'm starting this off on a weird note, but that's how I heard about this trailer. It's- she is a comedian. She has that, I don't know if it's a YouTube short or whatever, where she has people on and interviews them, and they basically have to try to get her to guess how they're famous and who they are, because she her shtick is basically like she doesn't know mainstream media and pop culture stuff. Or at least that's right. where I know her from. I know she's done other comedic stuff, but that's my main interface with Tignataro. Well, it's it's interesting because she's in the trailer for all of, I don't know, two seconds, but she looks badass. And that's like, that's the point is like, wow, Tignataro looks badass. And so suddenly she was trending on Twitter. But you, you go and watch this whole trailer. Now, this is not the first thing we're hearing of this movie. I'm sure it's come up on the podcast before. I don't know when exactly I remember specifically, but I'm sure it's come up. Dave Bautista is kind of, I would say, kind of the headlining actor. Uh, but this is a Zack Snyder production, and really the the thesis of it, you can go watch, pause and go watch the trailer now if you haven't, but you're taking a heist movie, and you're taking a zombie movie, and you're putting them in a honeymoon suite with a heart-shaped tub, and saying, do what comes naturally, and this is the product of that. Meaning they had a baby, guys. That's, that's where the metaphor is going. Which is, before even getting into the nuts and bolts of this, on paper, 
that is a brilliant idea. It, it's very easy to connect with because it's again it's taking two very commonly known and loved genres and putting them together and seeing what comes out so i'm into that kind of at face value i'm into that getting into the trailer itself i think with zombie movies what i want to get into with you guys is the nature of zombies because i think the nature of like like if you're gonna make a zombie show or a zombie movie i am of the opinion the zombie that i want to see is the dawn of the dead zombie the remake dawn of the dead zombie it's the world which War zack Z snyder zombie. was also responsible for i believe right i believe you're right the point i'm trying to make is the walking dead zombie is a boring zombie and i i, I think i might get pushback from you guys on this no but- i definitely agree like I don't know. One of my favorite zombie movies, and I really love the mashup where zombie movies don't take themselves super seriously. Like, I know I had that big Walking Dead phase, but honestly, like, my favorite zombie movies are the ones that are funny. Like, there's there's got to be a comedy aspect. And I there's feel levity. like yeah. when you have slow, meandering zombies, that's just not funny for the most part. The funniest right. zombies have been in, like, Zombieland, where there's multiple different types, kind of like in Left 4 Dead. And right. they approach them all in a funny way. And I feel like everything they showed in this trailer was basically in that vein. I mean, they had a heckin' zombie tiger. You know, there's definite zombie types happening here. You guys say this, but honestly, if zombies were exclusively the geriatric style zombies, it doesn't matter. Everyone's going down either way. Okay, so, you're, so those are just should, as scary as. But I'm Batman. talking about what's entertaining, and I feel like having the zombies that are like blah, 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 coming at you is way funnier to watch than the just turkey zombies. Exactly. <laughs> that well, <laughs> sounded like a turkey to me. In my opinion, it doesn't matter what type of zombie it is. You can have an entertaining movie, but that said, the point at which you're introducing the zombies is really what makes it the most interesting. And that's kind of what I find most interesting about this movie is they're not introducing a outbreak. They're introducing, hey, post zombies happened. They're in this area. This is now kind of normal life. Go get it. And that's like a, a totally new take than what we're used to seeing, which is standard outbreak. It's a crazy zombie. You know, run for your lives. And but here's my, that's, that's what's exciting about this. But I want to poke a hole in that. Well, first of all, I want to push back on... I think if every zombie that existed kind of shambled around, I don't think we'd be screwed. That that's a different topic. We don't have to dwell dwell on that. But I want to like, yeah, the idea here is that it, I think it's Las Vegas has been cordoned off. Like it was a site of a zombie outbreak. Maybe other major cities were as well. But this is at least one site of a major zombie outbreak that has been in some way cordoned off, and the zombies are still in there. My question is, if you are the u.s government assuming that it still exists in this fictional universe aren't you just gonna carpet bomb the crap out of that like you don't want to just leave a million zombies in like a chain link you don't know what the state of the government is though it it could just be small sub colonies of people at this point but still you would think there would be some kind of small colony with global carpet bombs i don't know well i'm more like a global effort to like okay we have these kind of patches where like we put up big concrete walls or put chain link fence whatever but we have to like we have to do something about this because any yahoo could go in there and you know in this in this example what this movie is creating try and steal a bunch of money that's still on the las vegas in the vaults and the casinos in las vegas and then if they get bit and they get out then we have a whole nother outbreak on our hands it seems like it's a major like like if so, you're the cdc you want to nip that in the butt. fun fact about vegas it's filled with tunnels. Well, sure, and I'm sh- and we 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 actually see a little bit of that in the trailer. I mean, all these I watched Ocean's Eleven. I know what the deal is. There's all kinds of underground vaults and everything. But to be clear, I can get past that quote unquote hole in the premise, right? I this is the kind of movie that I, Nerbomber, you were saying this before. Like the best kind of zombie movie, and also I think the best kind of heist movie. You're encouraged to kind of check your fact checking part of your brain at the door when you go into the theater right and this is a proverbial theater who know COVID, whatever but with when you have a a heist movie and a zombie movie combined that that like sense is even more elevated where this is going to be a ridiculous movie right like it's not looking to be taken seriously i don't think and i think that's to its credit i mean this I'm so excited about this, and I'm really excited about the launch on Netflix. I know it said it's in select theaters, but 
in my area, I still can't go to a theater. And so I'm really stoked that we're getting something that seems like such a huge movie because I feel like this would have been a pretty big theatrical release. And we're getting it on Netflix. And I know, I feel like we'll miss something by not being in the theater for this because you will, even if you have a good surround sound system, you miss the big atmospheric giant mega screen with like oh, yeah. rumble seats There's basically. No but I'm I'm super excited for this because I feel like I've been in a movie hole where there hasn't really been a lot of good movies coming out. Like I know we had Godzilla versus Kong and next weekend we have Mortal Kombat. But I feel like in normal times you have like five movies releasing every other week and we well, haven't the- had that. It's been a drip dry. And this looks like so much fun. And we haven't really had a good zombie movie in a while. Like, well, what was the right. last good zombie movie? I think Zombieland 2 did come Zombieland out. Zombieland 2. But, yeah, like, that's what I was going to say. Other than that, what, what have we had? Um, yeah, I don't know. There was that, um, what was the J.J. Abrams? It was part of the Cloverfield thing. But it was during World War II and it was zombies. Can't think of what it was called now. But I agree with you. Um, and you, you're actually touching on a point that I wanted to make. I was going to wait until Shang Chi to make it, but the trailers that I have seen, these two being some of them, like in the past few weeks, to me, it's signaling the movie industry saying, yeah, you know, for better or for worse, okay, societally, we're starting to come out of this and the big movie time is coming back, baby. And again, whether or not that's true, I think it's creating this sense of this is so exciting. Big movies are coming back. Whether you see them in a theater or on Netflix, it's an exciting time for, for movie fans. So yeah, Army of the Dead feeds into that for me. It looks like an ensemble cast that's going to... I mean, heist movies are built around ensembles, right? And to me, they kind of live or die by that, that chemistry between between characters. But I'm I'm really into this, really into this idea. I'm not like... Zack Snyder and me have a, have a complicated relationship because 300 is fine. I like Watchmen a lot. Big Watchmen fan. But like outside of that, I could take him or leave him. So well, maybe after this, I will take him. What's I don't know. curious is that obviously like the, the film style is very still dark. Like you kind of have that dark and grainy feel where it's a little less saturated. Like the colors aren't saturated very much. You can just right. see that in the trailer. And that that's kind of Zack Snyder's stylistic trademark, if you will. But one of the other things that Zack Snyder is known for, I would say, is a lot of just very dark, kind of serious, brooding movies. And this seems more this fun. That. Yeah. And I like it. Like, I feel like, like I said, the Snyder Cut, I was actually surprised to have liked it as much as I did. And the 300 was a very okay movie. Like, I didn't. I wasn't like blown out of the water by the 300, but I didn't hate it. Like I thought it was entertaining enough, but I feel yeah. like having that juxtaposition of dark grainy film style with a fun kind of colorful shoot em action up. shoot 'em up is super cool. I like it. I think I watched 300 thinking like, oh man, you know, it'd be funny as if I watched 300, but then I like kind of found myself, okay, this is like pretty good. I think I thought it was going to be a joke and it wasn't. I don't know why I thought it was going to be a joke. I think it's like a decently well-regarded movie, but I think it just seemed like it wasn't going to be my kind of movie. And to a large extent it was, but it still got through to me. And like you said, this is like, it's coming across as much more jovial. Like to me, this is, this looks like more of a James Gunn project than a Zack Snyder project, or at least Mm -hmm. premise wise it does. Or like, you know, Steven Soderbergh who did uh, the oceans movies, but also did Logan Lucky, which if you haven't seen Logan Lucky, it's like Oceans. It's like they redid Oceans, but everybody's a redneck. And it's great. My best hope for this movie, at least on the heist side of things, is that it captures that energy because Oceans 11 is top five movies of all time for me. Like it's one of my favorite movies ever. It's going to be interesting to see how a heist movie can be pulled off in the context of zombies because, I and mean, you know, there might be some element of like, you know, this Las Vegas bubble of zombies probably has some kind of security they're going to have to thwart, right? But usually the, the premise of a heist movie is not we have to avoid zombies. It's we have to fool people and it's a it's a caper. You know, that's another term for the genre. You have to fleece people into giving you what you want. You have to trick security systems, everything. There's not going to be as much of that here, I don't think. There's clearly a safe cracking element, but the safe is it's unattended. So by the time you get there no one's watching you and it, it, it creates this very it, again it puts a spin i think on each of the individual genres that come together to form this unique genre pair so it's going to be very cool to see tactic before we move on any anything else to add on this one 
I just get a lot of plot twisty vibes from this too, so I'm really excited to see what they do when they actually get to the safe. I'll bet you it's going to be something very unexpected in that safe. That just you're think it's the oh, vibe okay. I'm getting. I was, I was, I thought you were going for like one of them's a turncoat kind of situation. They're gonna, there's gonna be some double crossing, which again, is a little bit. It's certainly not really characteristic of the Ocean's movies, but it's characteristic of a lot of heist movies. So yeah, that will be something to see. I do want to give a sh- quick shout out to Garrett Dillahunt is also in this and they showed him for maybe like 30 seconds. I feel like he is a very underrated actor who can be super funny. He's been in a lot of different stuff and has had a range of like, he's been in Deadwood, but he was also in the Mindy Project and Raising Hope, which is where I know him best from. And I feel like he could be really funny. And I feel like this is an awesome role for him. I don't know yeah. if either of you are familiar with him, but... I You might as well have made the name up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. Haven't seen any of your stuff. But... Well, now you will. So yeah, uh, May 14th, 2021 is when this drops. Dave Bautista, Dave Bautista, Tignataro, and then quite frankly, a lot of people who I have never heard of, which is, you know, interesting given the what I look for in heist movies, having pulled together a, a tight crew. This is no Ocean's Eleven in that regard. Ocean's Eleven was like, let's get every megastar that exists and put them into a movie. This is taking a different approach, which I'm all for. So May 14th, as Nerdbomber mentioned, will be coming to Netflix. We'll see how that is. I mean, it's less than a month from now. Good grief. Very exciting. Give me good movies and give me them now. Let's, let's sandwich the, the trailers in between the Amazon news. So I don't. So what I remember about Amazon in terms of The Lord of the Rings is that they were developing a show. That is still happening, as far as I know, and I'd be surprised if that died. At some point, and again, we may have mentioned this in the podcast, I have the memory of a goldfish, by the way, if it hasn't been made clear. Amazon had an in development a Lord of the Rings MMORPG, which on paper sounds like a no-brainer, right? Take Warcraft and put it in the Lord of the Rings universe. You can spin that for, for decades before you run out of things to, you know, DLCs to put out. Uh, well, it's been canceled, <laughs> uh, is what the piece of news here is. First announced in 2019, it's first reported by Bloomberg to be in development at Amazon Game Studios in conjunction with a China-based game developer, which was then purchased by Tencent in December 2020. Well, now, because Tencent acquired that company that Amazon was working with, it has basically been put in the deep freeze. So... I, what, I think what we need to talk about here is uh, to get to the crux of the matter, why this hasn't happened. Because with well, the Lord of the Rings, you know, have you guys ever played a Lord of the Rings video game? I First have. I know there's like Lord of the Rings online and I know there were like a bunch of Lord of the Rings games I, and I've like dabbled, but not really gone into them that much. Tactic, how about you? I have not played a single Lord of the Rings game. Lord of the Rings Return of the King, which was the movie tie in. This was back in the GameCube PS2 xbox generation movie I, I want to back then were dope oh it was a, i want to say i'm 99 sure one of my top 10s that i did for one of the vlogs for the patreons i did a top 10 video games of all time and it, this was on there because one of the better i mean best movie tie-in game i've ever played hands down bar none but it had such great combat like the sword combat you could learn you could learn combos it had this it's kind of like you could learn moves and spend experience to get moves and kind of level up. And then you would play through missions that basically mirrored scenes from the movie and string together combos, much in like an Arkham asylum kind of way. And it was just absolutely fabulous. Now, they've since taken a turn away from the movie tie-ins, obviously, since the movies have stopped coming out. And they've gone to like Shadow of Mordor, Shadow of War, I think, were the two most recent. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, those Lord have always games. been on my backlog. And I have both of them. I think they were given out for free with, as like a game with gold or something at some point, both of them. But like those are supposed to be really good. They're supposed to be good. I, I don't know the deal with them. But, you know, right now in the hopper too, we also have a Gollum video game, which I can't remember who is doing that or when that's coming, but I know that's in the hopper. I played actually an, another really, really good game. Uh, and it was not a movie tie-in, but it was in the GameCube generation. Actually, it might have been before the movies came out or around the time they did. Certainly before the Hobbit movies came out, there was a Hobbit game on the GameCube. Oh, I remember that. I did that play was, that on PlayStation. And that was actually phenomenal as well. It was so, like a cute 3D platformer. I remember yeah. there were like a lot of giant mushrooms and like walking through the forest. It was much, that was much more of like a, yeah, like almost harkening back to like the Banjo-Kazooie kind of things. But it was super, super, like the point I'm trying to make is this should be happening and whether or not it's an mmorpg 
I'm surprised to see so few Lord of the Rings games go out. And maybe it's because the Tolkien estate is stingy with its with its IP, but I'm not sure that that's what it is either. I think it might just be that for some reason that I'm not seeing, it's hard. But Well, I mean, honestly, if you're the Lord of the Rings IP estate holders right now, you do like you had this game coming out before the Tencent acquisition and whatever went wrong there. You right. had I mean, I think the Lord of the Rings online is still technically active. And then you do have is, that Gollum yeah. video game out there. Plus you had Shadow of Mordor. So, I mean, you you have all these games coming out. So that leads me to wonder, like, this is such a big IP. And especially on the heels of Shadow of Mordor being such a big game. And like it won a ton of awards. If you have this IP and you, you're developing a game and they've been developing this game, I think it revealed in 2018, 2019, something like that. What was Tencent asking when they re- acquired that studio that Amazon was working with that would make Amazon be like, you know what? Screw this. We're out. Like, we've been working on yeah. this game for like three, four years, but we're done. That's a really good, that's a really good question. Like, what were they asking? I want to know. But, I, but like, but even go and there's another one, another game we haven't mentioned, by the way, which is Battle for Middle Earth, which I think that's more of like an RTS situation. Mm-hmm. But going like what I would envision, and I, I'm sure this was not what it was because it was an MMORPG, but like thinking back to how good those movie tie-in games were, because I also played the Two Towers. There was not a Fellowship of the Ring tie-in. I think the Two Towers kind of morphed some Fellowship content into that game. But like if you create a game such that at the beginning of the game, you know, you play as Frodo probably, and you go get to Rivendell, and then you get to choose one of the nine members of the Fellowship to play. And then you just follow that character's path and you play that entire, play that character's quest, basically, that and combine all the movies. That would be a great, I would buy, I would, I would buy that in a second. And then you finish one character's quest, you can go back and play as another character, sometimes going through the same missions and seeing how that character is better for you. Like, it just seems like it, sh- it, it should be a no brainer. You don't, you don't even have to make it non-linear, make it linear, make it fit into the existing storyline. And then release DLCs for The Hobbit. Release DLCs for The Silmarillion. Release DLCs. There's DLCs coming out your butt with that IP. I nice. mean, basically, what the Avengers did. The yeah, Marvel Avengers yes. game that came out, that's exactly the same premise. And I feel like, I mean, obviously, that game has that had a work. rocky yeah. <laughs> start. But I think that was more from Square Enix not really communicating well with their audience and things getting delayed and things not working as well as they wanted it to. But I mean, if you have all of those kinks ironed out, I think that's still a good game premise and applying it to the Lord of the Rings and being able to play through each character like that with other people. That sounds dope as hell. Dope and and as we're, hell. we're also, we're, we're, for, we're much farther removed, right? Like I think, and, and you know, this was the issue I had, this was the issue a lot of people had when Avengers came out, the game, People said, "Wait a second, that's not." Oh yeah, the junior. That's I don't know if it's you know that's not the uncanny valley effect because they looked like people, but it didn't look like the right right people. (laughs) But my but my point is with the Lord of the Rings. You know, the last movie came out in like what two thousand three or something. It's been almost twenty years now since the last movie came out. I I think I have that year wrong. It might have been like oh seven. It was one of the. It was in the aughts. So my point is, we're far enough removed from that now, even with the Hobbit being considered, which is kind of a whole separate thing, that the character models can be more generic. You don't need to use the same voice actors. You you can give yourself some more creative freedom. You can make this the, you know, the scenery, the sets, the locations, they can look different than what the movie had and people won't be as angry with you. But you can still create that cohesive experience using a, a story that you know is going to resonate with people and just make a great single player game. Like why why has that not been done is my See, question. The crazy thing is not so much why it hasn't been done, but rather why this specific studio has consistently had multiple cancellations on multiple different programs. This this one is now joining games like Crucible and Breakaway. And where is the confidence in the future at this point? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've heard about Tencent. I, you don't hear much about Chinese game studios. What's the story there? I agree. I, I, I want to know. And are you, are you talking about Amazon? Because has Amazon put out a game? I think he was talking about Amazon because, yeah, all of those games, I think Amazon did put out Crucible and then it was so bad, they literally pulled it and shut it down after it launched. So, I mean, 
That said, they still have one MMORPG in the works called New World. It's slated to re- be released August 2021, but like, are you guys even confident that that's going to come to fruition? If I haven't heard anything about it yet, then no. Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, with the track record here, and I know this Lord of the Rings game was primarily on the shoulders of Tencent, you would presume, or whatever negative interaction happened here, but like, oof. I feel like I have no confidence in Amazon Game Studios to do anything right now. Well, what, what, if, if you're Amazon, we're, we're getting away, I guess. I, I, well, we're not getting away from the topic because the topic is Amazon had this had to cancel this game. But like, if you're Amazon, what is the motivation for you to get into to just open a game studio? Well, didn't they what am I missing have, here? Didn't they introduce Amazon? Was it Luna? Their streaming oh, game right. service. I don't know. If, I have honestly have not heard anything about it since it launched. Boy. I don't know if it's good or bad. Honestly, if any of our it listeners know, somebody? I'm pretty sure it did. Yeah. So if any of our listeners use it, I would love to hear what your experience has been like because I like I really haven't heard anything about it since it launched. So I, I feel like in the, fall 2020, it's been going for a while. Mm-hmm. So maybe I feel like that was obviously their motivation for getting in the gaming sphere because I know they had that deal with Ubisoft, but honestly, to have your own first party games, we've seen how that sells systems. So with both Nintendo and Sony and in the past, Microsoft, I know Microsoft hasn't been releasing that many first party studio games lately, but I mean, it's still in early access. Is it? So maybe that's why, but maybe they were like intending for these games to come out and be like these major things to get people in the door and want to use Amazon Luna. Early access to subscribers by invitation beginning on October 20th, 2020. I didn't get an invite. I didn't get an invite either. I'm offended. I think my mom owns my Amazon Prime account technically. Hi, mom. (laughs) So if she got it, I didn't hear about it. Mrs. Illegal has just been playing all the time you yeah. call her and she doesn't pick up and it's because she's playing on amazon luna yeah she's been, is it she's luna been, or luma i don't even know it's it's luna okay. like the moon she's been cranking through all the all the ubisoft games or ubisoft however you want to pronounce it yeah that's a good point i had forgotten about luna i guess they're keeping it a secret i like we, we when did we talk about it? it had to be last year sometime of course but was that an e3 thing that they like it might have just been an amazon event that they announced it or something yeah i think there was I an Amazon event it. where they introduced because they introduced remember that amazon drone thing the home drone yeah is that still going on still a big fan of that probably still going on this still year it feels like a weird time warp because like i know fall technically wasn't that long ago but it feels like we talked about that years ago i suggest we do the time warp again if you google amazon drone you just get prime air which no one it's not the same thing but it's not a single lull okay I didn't see, like, I know the song, but I didn't watch, uh, what's the movie that song's in? Let's Rocky Horror. Do- yeah, Rocky Horror. Rocky Picture Horror Picture Show. Show. What happened? Yeah, but I don't even, I guess the drone must have been called something, because when, when I Google Amazon drone, it nothing happens. Yeah, the MMORPG has been canceled. Lord of the Rings fans shed a tear. I This is the Twitter call out. At OW Illegal 86, at Online Warriors 1, at OW Tactic, at OW Nerd Bomber, I beseech you. Tell me why the game that I described has not yet happened. Because what the heck? Like I I legitimately want, I want to know what I'm missing here. But yeah, pour one out for for Amazon Game Studios. We are going to talk about Shang-Chi when we come back. But first, we're going to take a short break. Shout out a sponsor. Before we do that, I would be remiss. If I did not shout out our fantastic Patreon producers, Mr. Ben Shackness, Mr. Stephen Keller, take a bow. We're here because of you. We continue to be here because of you. Uh, we continue to be here because of all of our Patreon support. Ben and Stephen, though, are our, our loyal knights, our Patreon producers. As a result of their support, they get access to the monthly secret segment and vlog, of course, but they also get input into our weekly game segment and they get this producer shout out as well as guest segments on occasion. We also have a Squire level of support, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog, and a page level, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment. So if you like listening to the show, if you've enjoyed our banter or lack thereof, or if you've enjoyed any part of it and want to give back, want to help us keep this thing going, keep the lights on, you can head over to patreon.com slash online warriors podcast for more of the details. Thanks to Ben. Thanks to Steven. We will take a short break now to shout out some sponsors, some other sponsors, and we'll be right back. Do you 
experience digital eye strain from too much blue light exposure from our digital screens? Baxter blue glasses are not your average frames. These blue light lenses filter 80% of the highest energy blue light, eliminating 99% of glare. The past year, we have all been glued to our devices more than ever. After working remotely, binging endless hours of Netflix, tending to my super dope Animal Crossing Island, and scrolling through Twitter endlessly, my screen time is through the roof. Our exposure to digital light has soared, and our eyes and our sleep are suffering as a result. Baxter Blue is also a force for good. They provide a pair of reading glasses for someone in need for every pair sold. This is eyewear built for our digital age, and Baxter Blue is giving our listeners 10% off your next purchase of blue light, sleep, or kids' glasses. Click the link in our show notes for your exclusive discount. This is the sign you have been waiting for to invest in blue light glasses. We know you will love your Baxters, and we know that you'll feel the difference. Thanks again for sponsoring this week's episode, and now, back to the show. Okay, so we are here to talk about Shang-Chi, which over the break, I learned that I pronounced it wrong a handful of times in the first (laughs) half of the episode. So my apologies for that. Shang-Chi is what we're talking about. And we have a trailer in front of us, or rather, we've all watched the trailer that released today. And I want to I want to get into this because, boy, oh, boy, this seems different than anything that Marvel has done to this point. I mean... I'd, I'm having a hard time even describing what I what I find to be different, but you know it does harken back a little bit to one of my favorite movie franchises ever, which is Rush Hour, and and I guess generally, you know the genre of kung fu, which is there's a dearth of kung fu movies, and especially when I was younger, I used to love the genre and I love the fighting style and I love seeing martial arts, and we're gonna get a really strong dose of that here. So I want to swing it over to our comic book expert. Because what's going on here? Like character wise, tell me about the Ten Rings. Because I, when I see the Ten Rings, the first thing I think of is the Mandarin. And, you know, is he involved here? Uh, yeah, when I think of the Mandarin, I, of course, think of Iron Man 3. But that was the fake Mandarin. That wasn't the real Mandarin. That mm-hmm. was kind of a looky loo. So what's the story here? So the premise here is it's about a hero whose abilities is just he's really, really well trained in Kung Fu. And the story arc is for this character is sort of in the same vein of the genre. I don't want to give any spoilers, but who the main villain is going to be is... Yeah, I kind of backed you into a corner on that one. ...100% been done before in this specific genre. And I'm not mad about it. It is a dark, hardened character development that occurs that really puts a the character in some trials and tribulations to to grow and set themselves on either a path of good or a path of evil and it's 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 always that struggle and that character growth and development that i find most interesting i've told you guys before that my favorite part about comic books is the backstory and how they got from point a to point b and and this specific character is is, is absolutely interesting it, it opens with showing the young kid being trained by his father being brought up to fight and take on the bad guys, quote unquote. And some stuff happens and he grows and becomes the character we want him to be. I don't want to spoil, but you know what? I'm going to spoil because if well, it you seems don't... they gave him like what it said in the trailer. He had like 10 years to, to do his own thing. And then he has to be like brought back into the fold or something like that. What's on his arms? Is that a spoiler? Can you tell me what's on his arms? Those are the 10 rings. Those, so the, okay. So those are the 10 rings and those give him is this a vibranium situation i mean i know no. it's not gonna be vibranium Ma- exactly. most of his abilities are based on just his strong kung fu ability okay see that's good i want more heroes that do not have superpowers that's the thing that should happen and but, but but i mean they're glowing something's going on with those rings i believe this is from memory i believe they're really have grilling some, you here yeah sorry some, <laughs> some temporal abilities i, I i'm not okay. well versed on those rings so to speak but That's not going to be the major story arc, in my opinion. And spoiler, 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 because this is probably what they're going to do, since it's kind of centered around his father. So in the the comics, his father trains him to fill his place, and he's always saying, you got to take down the bad guys, you got to be good, you got to be good. Well, it turns out his father is bad, and the bad guys were good guys. And yeah, like that that was that kind of came through to me in the trailer, to be honest. And (laughs) he finds this out, and now is. 
his number one enemy in his story arc is his own father. And in my opinion, that's why I had prefaced this with, this has been done time and time again in Kung Fu movies. You can even picture him going, he's my father. In the trailer, it's kind of character design, but like the guy looks bad. I remember thinking, I remember being confused, watching it like being, is that the bad guy? Because it sure looks like him. But you have Aquafina in that, clearly, what is clearly a comedic role, mm-hmm. which I'm very on board with that. I like what they're doing here. Are you familiar with Simu Liu at all? I'm not. Okay, so he plays Jung on Kim's Convenience, which is a Canadian comedy. And Fantastic. actually, one of the showrunners, if you are familiar with Schitt's Creek and love Schitt's Creek at all, one of the showrunners actually left Schitt's Creek to join and start working on Kim's Convenience. And it actually, the show just ended. There was a lot of drama about how it ended because the main showrunner, not the guy from Schitt's Creek, but the guy who basically wrote and the entire show was based on his life, decided he was just burnt out and like up and left. But it was an incredible show while it ran. And it's probably of the shows I stumbled on in 2020 sitting at home, Kim's Convenience is arguably kind of tied i think with schitt's creek like schitt's creek was great but kim's convenience was also really good and i think the fact that simu liu is getting recognized because i think this is a a really cool role a in that i think we need more diverse superheroes i mean i I don't i think having a kung fu master is cool in and of itself but also, the fact that he has the the background to also be a comedic actor, I think, could bring something really fun. Because as we all know, the difference between Marvel and DC movies is Marvel movies are more fun and they tend to be a little bit more funny. So I feel like this is going to have a really big impact on what people are into because kung fu movies, not that they've gone away totally, but since Jackie Chan kind of got older. Yeah, I, was I mean, he's kind of aging out. There hasn't really been a kung fu star, so to speak. Right. And I think hurling the giant budget of Marvel behind a fun kung fu movie. Plus, he's ripped. I mean, the dude's ripped. Oh, yeah. Like, I feel like this is a really great chance for a really great actor to get a lot of exposure and potentially have a tentpole in the entertainment industry for a long time to come. And well, right. I think it's cool. Well, and, and, you know, make no mistake, the fact that I'm asking these questions who is this guy? What's the deal with his origin story? Blah, blah, blah. Basic questions. That is a great position for Marvel to be in, right? Because I think what people don't like, you know, people have not liked about Marvel, take Spider-Man, for example. Everyone knows how Spider-Man started. They took a good route uh, with Spider-Man, which is we're going to skip the origin story. But when you skip the origin story, there are there are narrative issues. Going through exposition in a movie is a lot harder when you skip over the character's origin, right? Well, that's why we ended up having all of these Disney Plus TV shows to give all of these smaller yeah. characters an origin story because they kind of rushed over it and skipped it. But the point is now getting into later phases with Marvel, they can introduce characters that are that have critical importance like this character, but they don't have they don't feel any pressure to skip the origin story because it's not going to be interesting because people are going to know it's going to happen. People don't know. Like they've cut through I think to only the core comic book fans know what's going on when they watch this trailer. And I don't know what percent of like Marvel's audience that is, but it's low. It's very low. So I think now they're going to really start reaping the benefits. And like you said, with the Disney Plus shows, they're kind of doing the same thing. Like, Tactic, you you did mean to do this because I think I baited you into doing it. And I won't repeat what you said here. But Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I'm in the process of watching that now. And you kind of spoiled something that was going to happen. And uh-huh. the manner in which you did that was in such a way that, you know, there's a character on the show who they say, I'm so-and-so. And they say what their name is. The name means something to me, Joe the Plumber, basically, watching this show. Comic book fans heard the name and thought, oh, this guy is eventually going to become X and Y. I didn't know that. So I I kind of got to see it happen. I technically gave me an inkling it was going to happen. So I kind of got the sense it was going to happen. But the point is, for people, if you don't have someone like Tactic in your ear telling you, oh, this person is this person, they have a lot more freedom now to get away from things that every Joe Schmo is going to know and get into things that no one is. And uh, like you said, it's, it, another great thing about this is that they can introduce uh, another diverse character and 
really fill out the Marvel universe and and well, all the while doing different things than, than what they've done. So well, I think that's the thing I'm most excited about is that yes, this is a superhero movie, but it's going to feel different than a superhero movie because it's going yes. to feel more like a kung fu movie. And like you said, like this is an origin story, so it's not like we had to have watched a bunch of crossover films prior to watching this to get what's going on. Like if you didn't watch any Marvel film what I got out of this trailer was like, you could walk into this movie and still be really entertained. And you yeah. would basically be introduced to a slew of new characters and you wouldn't have to keep track of all of these different plot lines from like 15 other Marvel movies. We're and back to a point where I the, like most, that. the most crossover you're going to get is a stinger at the end. I, and I expect this movie will have a stinger at the end saying, Oh, this is how this guy meets Scarlet witch or something. But outside of that, we get to in this movie be in a bubble where it feels like a totally different thing and that's that's great and you know the people at marvel and i guess disney on top of marvel they aren't stupid they know that by the time endgame which was by the way a great movie but by the time that rolled around we were all experiencing fatigue and thought okay this is turning into the same thing and also a, a tangled mess they have a very herculean task now and of, that's when they induced the pandemic to stop movies for a while <laughs> right right they got disney yeah, you, Oh, God, I don't want to be the start to a conspiracy theory. Please note that this is not by any way, shape, or form a real thought or thing that is happening. But we're at a point, you know, yeah, pandemic aside, I'm sure they thought about, okay, people are going to need some kind of breather, you know, and they came out with Spider-Man Homecoming and came up with Captain, Captain Marvel? No, not Captain Marvel. Captain did Marvel? They, did they come up with Captain Marvel after Endgame? Oh, I no, think, she was before. Yeah, yeah you're right. Spider-Man Homecoming was after... Not Homecoming. Far From Home. Far From Home. Spider-Man... There's been so many of these things. Spider-Man Far From Home was after Endgame. And then Black Widow was... Is, you know, we still haven't seen that yet, but it's supposed to put a bow on, on her story. But now we're able to get into a point where we're getting some... The TV shows are what are responsible, I guess, for bleeding certain characters from one phase to another. But we're going to start getting these these big tentpole movies that are totally new characters and it's going to be a shot in the arm for the entire universe i think and it's going to be huge uh, you know an important breath of fresh air for everybody so a plot i mean yeah i don't we didn't get into the nuts and bolts too much go watch the trailer if if, if you're interested but i think the moral for all of it is that we're very excited for this Yes. And also go watch Kim's Convenience. And go watch Kim's Convenience. It's all going to be on Netflix. I think the final season is coming up on Netflix in May. So start now and you'll be able to just roll right through. I thought it was a Netflix original. Was it not? Uh, it was a Canadian, I think, it. what is it, CBC? And yeah, kind of like They're... what Schitt's Creek did, where yeah. it aired in Canada and then Netflix kind of co-opted it for streaming. Canada's doing it, man. Mm -hmm. With the TV. Right on. We're going to move into uh, what are you up to? What are you up to Wednesday for this week where we say what we've all been up to? I'm going to kick things off here because I think I'm going to be pretty short, but I want to shout out, first of all, in its, you know, asking about the medium in general, audiobooks. What's the deal with you two? Are you audiobookers at all? I struggle with audiobooks. I have to be in the right frame of mind. So like there are certain times of days and certain activities where I can listen to a podcast or an audiobook. And that's like working out is one of those times where I can listen to people talking. But if I'm doing like any kind of detail oriented work, like if I'm doing anything with numbers or something like right. that, I can't. I had any music. Way. I need passive listening. Yeah, I'm the same way. I actually, it's at the point now for me where I actually can't even listen to music with words when I'm working because the words distract me. So I hear you. Tactic, audiobooks, yay, nay. I would audiobook exclusively for road trips. Yeah, that's when I, I typically do it too. So. I just listened to an audiobook. So I mentioned that I was reading Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. That was in actual book book form. Finished that. Fantastic read. Strongly recommend it to anyone who is into pop psychology kind of stuff. But I also picked up the audiobook of Blink, which is one of another one of his popular books. And I actually rented this from the library. Most libraries now, guys, you can rent audiobooks for free ninety nine online without leaving the comfort of your home. Strongly recommend doing that. Nerd Bomber, I know you're a big ebook and uh, I mean not audiobook, but you're a big ebook from the library person, if I remember. Oh correctly. yeah, I um, think libraries. I feel like most people don't know that libraries are severely underutilized. Like you said, yeah. you can get basically any ebook that you want. Didn't have to leave the house. Yeah, it was fantastic. And even like I have a local like 
county sort of library. But then there's a bunch of libraries within my state that I just have to be a state resident and I can access their libraries. It's so great. Yeah. Tenants I'd recommend. That's a derail um, for the library train. No, you didn't. I was I was looking for that kind of reinforcement of my PSA. So what Malcolm Gladwell released well, these two books, which I finished blank already, by the way. It, I would term it, it pop psychology, meaning it's Malcolm Gladwell was was and I think still is a writer for the New Yorker, and his kind of general shtick is he takes scientific studies, typically in terms of like psychology, sociology, social sciences. And he takes certain conclusions from those sorts of journal articles and things and tries to draw larger conclusions from them while also putting it into a book form that me, Joe Idiot, is going to go pick up and read and learn something. And they're fa- both both of them fascinating books. I'll talk more about Blink now because it's the one I just finished. But the basic idea of Blink, and I think the subtitle of Blink is The Power of Thinking Without Really Thinking. And it has to do with this idea that we all have what's called an adaptive I think it's called adaptive unconscious, either adaptive, I think adaptive subconscious, one of the two. And basically it amounts to the ability of human beings to make snap judgments and when and to what extent we should trust those snap judgments and when we shouldn't. And it's also, you know, one of the main thrusts of his kind of argument that he lays out through all these studies that have been done is as a society, we overvalue take the time, think think about things, make pros and cons lists, blah, 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 you know, really do due diligence on making decisions. But there are some times when that doesn't benefit us as much as doing what he calls thin slicing, which is making decisions based on very small amounts of information. And there are, again, mountains of studies that basically say in certain situations, that's the best thing for you to do. And it's a fascinating read, it's of course, nonfiction, if you haven't picked up on that already. Um, Honestly, I really like that because I feel like I get into this scenario sometimes when I get too much information and then I'm in analysis paralysis is what I like to call it because I I have too much information and then I can't make a decision. There's a whole section of the book about, I think he actually uses the term analysis paralysis and, and, you know, he actually frames it in the context of these big war games that took place within the U.S. government. There were basically these large training exercises back in the early 2000s before we got involved in the, in the wars in the Middle East. And the basic takeaway from the war games was analysis paralysis is really bad. And they took them, it took them like billions of dollars to learn that. But he's kind of, again, packaging up that sort of information, information from academic studies and saying, here's what you can take away from these things. And here's what society should be taking away from them as a whole. So I'm going to be reading more of him. I'm, I've been a big fan of, of these two books, but I wanted to shout out Malcolm Gladwell. The other thing I've completely different plane of existence, one show that I just got back into, and I'm sure I talked about this last year because it was one of the many reality show phenomenon that I got hooked into during the pandemic. The Circle is yes. back for season two. Are you guys How watching? How is it? I haven't started it yet, but I want to. But I know Tactic will judge me so hard. We just watched the, we watched the first episode and then The Circle does this annoying thing. I have to call them out. They do this annoying thing where they it's a reality show that ends on cliffhangers, which is the dumbest. It's so dumb. They all kind of do that, though. Not Survivor doesn't do that. Well, most Am- of them Amazing do Race that. doesn't do that. I could name many more that don't do that. Big Brother doesn't do that, I don't think. I think it's just the Netflix ones because the Netflix ones know that you're just going to, you know, not hit the button to stop. <laughs> so they're like, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're giving you that little extra push. But so we watched the first episode and then we watched the beginning of the second one because they always clean the cliffhanger up in like the first five minutes. Uh, so we just watched the first five minutes of that episode. But um, I mean, yeah, it's it, it's the same thing. But you know what? It was good the first time. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like you said, like there's a guilt. You're factor. lame. It's, I'm still waiting for Love is Blind season two. That was my biggest you better believe. pleasure. I mean, I you was better believe like, that's this coming. This is insane. Was I, the one, was I the one who was like, you need to watch this? Or were you the one who was like, I need to watch this? I can't remember. One of us was like, this is... I think it was me. I think... I think well, I think so. My I think my girlfriend at the time... Yeah, now feel free to take credit. It had nothing it. to do with us sitting in the doctor's appointment and being like, what is happening here? That's how it really started. I started it, and then y'all just forgot about me bringing it up. Is that really what happened? Yeah, that's what happened. But you yeah, won't remember I I, about I was, it because you're going to say you forgot. No, I was sick. And then he made fun of me because then the next day I was just like flying on the couch being like typical sick and just binging it. And he was like, why are you still watching this? You could watch it. I was going to say, I remember the one thing I do remember vividly. You watched it in like one day. Oh, yeah. And But I at the time, I swear. It. I think at the time, I'm trying to remember. No, yeah. Because I think you watched it before me because I remember I started it. 
and I and now we're getting into the weeds, but I was like, I like Carlton a lot. And you were like, keep watching. <laughs> because you had already seen all of it with him. Man, Love is Blind. I mean, that's not even what I'm talking about, but that show is also... Is Love is better- Blind the... Oh, no, I'm thinking 90 Day Fiance. That's what I'm thinking. That's the crazy show. All your shows that you guys are talking about is dumb. 90 Day Fiance is where it's at. Well, I mean, Love is Blind was basically 90 Day Fiance, but like, but like even like crazier. No, yeah, that was but- like The Bachelor meets 90 day fiance and it was all scripted 90 it day wasn't fiance, scripted though some of those people are still married but all those people are like you know typical good looking people and, and screw that nonsense oh well, they're farmed by talent scouts probably i it's want the- full-on mouth breather and person hey. that does not <laughs> speak a lick of english to get married in under 90 days that's what i want to watch that's the train days. wreck that i am here for in this household we did a little bit of 90 day fiance too that's a different animal your description of it is not inaccurate. I will say that much. Love is Blind, though. That was... And then there was the other one, and I don't think I ever talked about this on the show, but I'll talk about it now. Netflix kind of... I don't want to say they jumped the shark, but they came... They oh, came out with Love, Love is Island. Blind. Not Love, not Love Island. They came out with Love is Blind and then The Circle, and then they were like, we're going to get as horny as possible. And they came out with that show, Too Hot to Handle, which was oh, literally... that's what it was called. But it was basically Love Island. They literally put a bunch of boobs on an island and were like, don't have sex and we'll give you money. And guess what? Everyone had sex. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Everyone on that show had sex. I think. I don't I didn't I, we watched one episode and we literally were like, it's too much for us to even watch. And we didn't watch the rest. But a friend of mine told me they were like, Yeah, everybody, you know, all sorts of sex stuff happened. Did the dirty. The Was one guy like hoping he's gonna hold out or something like that. I didn't watch it. But I I mean at the beginning I know everyone's like, Yeah, I don't everyone's hot, but whatever. And then, you know, they all did it. The circle's not like that, though. Circle's at least a little bit less horny. Go watch the circle. I, I recommend it. It's an interesting study in uh, human interaction via social media, although it is also, at the end of the day, a reality show. So that's my update. Nerd bummer. What's up? All right. So we actually have a pretty big update. This was a relatively new release game. Tactic and I started playing Outriders because it's dope. Oh, it is it on new. Xbox Game Pass. So it launched on Game Pass. I don't remember if we talked about it, but it did. And so we started playing it and we're having a lot of fun with it. I would say that the play style would probably be akin to uh, Destiny meets Gears of War because it's got the third person shooter style, cover shooter style of Gears of War. And I think people can fly worked on one of the Gears of War titles potentially. But, but like the loot and the skill tree and all those type of game mechanics are straight from Destiny. Destiny. Yeah. yeah, like it, you even each Which different- Which I liked. Each character class that you can play as has different abilities that remind me very heavily of what you had in Destiny, like super power kind of deals. Right. And depending on which class you chose, you have different abilities. And so I picked the Devastator class, which is more of like a tank kind of character because that's that's what I always play. That's what I do. I get in people's face. And I picked the Trickster, which is more of like a quick assassin. Right. Uh- deception type dude like the hunter in destiny to yep keep and that's what destiny. i want for in destiny yeah. initially actually i went back and did the warlock but that's a story for another day and right. i will Sorry. say i know you really liked destiny illegal and so i, was I would into say that for a while one of my biggest knocks on destiny was that it was very difficult to get into the story because at least in the original iteration of destiny before they started patching it and stuff the story wasn't very fleshed out they kept sending you to go like on the internet to look up stuff about the story and to learn about the lore and that's not my thing like when i'm playing a game tell me the story i don't want to have to then go after i'm done playing and take like two hours to read up everything yeah i don't want to do that so I think one of the other comparisons, and I think I tweeted this as well, was that I don't know if you guys remember Defiance at all, but it was a sci-fi TV show that then they tried to make an integrated yeah. game experience. That I was, this. I think it, it came out in like the 360 era, and it was basically it was like a predecessor to Destiny, where it was an MMO RPG type experience but it was so bad and the show the tv show also died but the the general plot of it was that they were on this planet and big bad creature alien things were plaguing humanity and you had to go take them out and it was another looter shooter type thing and so essentially what i feel like i'm getting in this game is i'm getting the story experience that i wanted from 
defiance with the gameplay experience that I really like from both Destiny and Gears 4. And I'm having a lot of fun with it. Yeah, so it sounds like a positive overall review. Is this, co- is this co-op or are you guys switching off? It is co-op, but not split screen. So Yeah, uh-huh. you have like a, a three-person max fire team. So it, there's not even like the multiplayer aspects that you got with Destiny that I never really got into. You so don't have any is, of that. The question is, do you have an Xbox yet? No. So there's no online, really. There's no like, you get there's like, no, like matches and stuff. Yeah. It's not player versus player at all. It's all player versus enemy, which is what oh. I like. Because I, I just, I don't have the patience to get good. Oh, I see. I actually, I think the part of Destiny that I liked the most was the PvP stuff. Really? Yeah, which I I know I'm 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 the outlier there. I think most people played the PVE, you know, going on the raids and stuff. That wasn't me. I was I was just trying to kill people in the game. Yeah, but yeah. I, I would say this was. I think Ben also talked about it when he was on our show because he had played the demo and said that it was super great, which was part of the reason we wanted to try it. And I will say I am very very happy with it because there hasn't been a game like this in a while i think the last time we played something like this was probably gears 5 where like it had a pretty decent story and it was not like a public game it was just you know a little private fire team and you get to go have fun and kill bad guys so yeah yeah i was actually just thinking i need another another shooter experience i mean if you wait another like month you get mass effect I, we got to talk about that. We'll do that offline. But 60 bucks, I was hoping wasn't going to happen, and it's happening. I mean, so, someone's birthday is coming up. I'm just it's saying. Mine. It's mine for the <laughs> listeners. For <both laughs> sure. uh, okay, yeah, duly noted. Tactic, anything to add on the Outriders thing? I've never, I don't know if you were done either. Sounds like you said you had a big update. Well, the Outriders was the majority of my update. But in addition to that, we've also been catching up on Invincible, as well as we watched a semi-depressing movie starring ted mosby from how i met your mother josh radner is the actor (laughs) and um i forgot what the name of the movie was social people i believe yeah it was a movie called social people and it's basically about a guy's marriage falling apart and him just starting off of what might be an affair and then they just fall for each other so weirdly well spoiler (laughs) i mean it's obvious in the trailer it's not a spoiler social animals Social animals. Thank you. I tried, I tried to Google social people they, and it wasn't working. It's one of those <laughs> movies where they show the entire plot and all of the funny moments in the movie in the trailer. So then when you watch the movie, you're like, oh, all right. I saw everything coming. It was one of those, you know, how like Garden State is one of those movies that's like, it's not a feel good, but it's not a feel bad. It's just like a feel. It's just a feel. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of those type of movies. And weirdly, like, I like that kind of stuff. I feel like Technic always thinks it's a little bit of a bummer because we watch, well, right now, they're typically like the indie movies, you know, and there's not a lot of new movies coming out. So now we're like really delving in the indie bucket and that's what's left. Garden State is really good, by the way. I love uh, Garden State. Big fan of Garden State. Fortune Feimsters in this movie too. Mm-hmm. There's She's a the- lot of people. Um, also the the chick from Handmaid's Tale, whose name I'm not remembering, and the other person from Miss Mr. Robot. Is it Mr. Robot? She yes, from Handmaid's Tale. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth Moss is in this movie. No, no, no. One of the other characters, her best friend. Gotcha. Well, interesting. Thirty-eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Not very good. Thirty-seven Metascore. So. <laughs> yeah, like like I said, it was just one of those like indie just feel movies you didn't feel good you didn't feel bad I saw ted mosby and i wanted to watch you just felt something so if you want to feel something go watch social animals not social people social animals my bad there you have it does that mean it's quiz time it is quiz time and i am the quiz master because i won last week whoop, whoop. boo so this week we have ryan reynolds theme trivia Oh and boy, I, f- I feel like I'm up against the wall here. I think Tectic's a big Ryan Reynolds guy. You're not a big Ryan Reynolds guy? I am, but not to the extent that Tectic is. I kid you not. So my roommate and I, my freshman year of college, we actually had like, I don't know why we didn't just buy a poster, but we literally did like a printout of Ryan Me. Reynolds shirtless and he had a little Santa hat and that was like on our ceiling freshman year. We were strange. I don't know why. Sophomore year, it became me. Big printout. Santa but it, it wasn't a printout. It was actually you. They taped you to their <laughs> ceiling for an entire year. That's why he didn't do well in school that year. I don't know what to tell you. So wow. anyway, 
that was a fun little diversion, but we do legitimately have Ryan Reynolds trivia. This will again be Price is Right style. I have five questions and a tiebreaker. Don't make me use it. So let's get right into it. Tactic, let's collude to make her use it. Deal? Deal. All right. So Ryan Reynolds played Hannibal King in Blade Trinity back in 2004 and had to pack on the muscle for that role. How much muscle did he gain specifically for Blade Trinity in pounds? And we'll start this off. Tactic will go first. I'm going to say 35 pounds. That's too much. I think he's always stayed lean. I'm going to go with a nice 20. So Illegal gets this one. He gained 25 pounds of muscle. And he actually, I think if you Google it, there's a whole workout and diet regimen about how he was able to gain that much muscle for the role. It sounds like something that's probably not super sustainable, though. Right. It's like the Kumail, Kumail Nanjiani who was like, he posted that picture of him ripped and was like, never do this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm on the board. Recently saw a picture of him. He has somehow gotten even more ripped, if you will believe it. Really? Yeah, the guy is super swole. Wait, Kumail or Ryan? Kumail. Oh, wow. Way to go, Kumail. There's hope for all of us. So the next question. Before Ryan Reynolds appeared on the big screen, he had some television roles, including Hillside when he was just a teenager and a 30-minute, in my opinion, criminally underrated comedy, Two Guys, A Girl, and a Pizza Place. How many episodes of Two Guys, A Girl, and a Pizza Place ran on air? Boy, it's not many. I'm going to say 24 because that would be a whole season of regular television. But my guess is it had a short first season, then came back for a second season that died before it finished. I'm going to say 24. I'm going to say 13. All right. You guys definitely undersold it. It actually ran for four seasons. It did have a shortened first season, but it did get through four seasons. So there were 81 episodes, but that means illegal gets the I'm point. I'm getting spanked. Oh, what this I'm is the status about. quo for this season. Spanking. Right now, the score, the spanking score is two to nothing. We need to get a a spank sound effect. That'd be good. (laughs) That'd be useful for a lot of situations. Instead of just the sweep. Yeah, I I might swap that out. That's a good suggestion. I forgot about the sweep. (laughs) But yeah. (laughs) We haven't needed the sweep. (laughs) Are we kidding? The spank's going to be better. But yeah, let's keep the party rolling. Ryan Reynolds was a huge proponent of Deadpool and a big reason why that movie and that IP took off and got made. How many years did he have to work on making his Deadpool dreams come true before the movie was made? This is a long time. Oh, I'm gonna I'm, say I'm gonna say six years. It's longer than that. It's way longer than that. I don't want to bust. The, I like I'm gonna do it. Seven years. I know it's longer. That did lock in your victory. What a jerk. giving you the third point, but you may not have the sweep yet. But spank, yeah, it was 11 years. He worked and petitioned for 11 years to get Deadpool into movie format. That wasn't a terrible Wolverine version. If I, by the way, if I do pull off the spank, I'm going to provide my own spank sound effect. So let I'm that be an incentive scared, to myself. I'm scared, but also curious. Let's find Moving out. on. Let's, yeah, let's move on to the next question. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is a famed Canuck. In what year was he named to Canada's Walk of Fame? This could be any year. Toughest question yet by far. If I go too late, I bust, right? That's the bust rules for, for years. Yes, sir. 2012. I'm trying to think when uh, he hit it big. Well, <laughs> uh, the safest guess would be to do the plus one, honestly. Do it. I'm going to go plus one. The sweep and the spank are dead. He was named to Canada's Walk of Fame in 2014. So Tactic oh, gets a point. You know what? I was really close. I know I didn't get spank, but... You You guys were both really close. Yeah. The score is now three to one. We have a final question and the tiebreaker, which I guess I can go through. Back in August, Ryan Reynolds sold his gin brand, Aviation Gin, for a pretty penny. I think we chatted about this briefly in an episode, so this is more of like a memory test for you guys. How much did he sell it for? And tactics first, right? Yeah. Yep. Nine million dollars. Way more. I'm going to, I mean, I'm not going to plus one you. I'm going to go up to 25 million. It was 610 million. Guys, yeah. I said a pretty penny, not a yeah. dull penny. I, I, by the way, I have I, no concept of, of penny aesthetic. I have <laughs> two, I have not one. And look, I'm not like an alcoholic. I have two bottles of aviation in my fridge right now. Is it good? I aviation is it. very good, guys. Ryan, hey, Ryan. First of all, I know a lot about you. We, we've just proven that. 
in quiz form. Second of all, good job on the gin. I would love to be in a Mint Mobile commercial. That's I'm not asking for it directly, but if you asked me, I would I would do it. If we ever do a online warriors after dark, we should all just drink aviation gin. We should make aviations because that's a cocktail. We should. And it's a gin there cocktail you can make. I I did that. The the old double aviation. Let me tell you. It's not just an airplane, it's a rocket ship. <laughs> Uh, we want to thank everybody for showing up, listening, sticking with us to the end here. I will be the quiz master next week. I ha- I'm at uh, six and two. Nerd Bomber at five and two and Tactic three and four. Tactic once again, shambling back to the drawing board, trying to figure out what went wrong. But uh, we'll see you next week if you can write the ship. And uh, we'll hopefully see all of you next week as well. It's been another fantastic episode of the Online Warriors podcast. We'll for sure see you again next week and uh, stay healthy, stay safe out there and be kind to each other.